It's not like the movies, you know, where there's a bunch of guys together. It wasn't like that for those first years. You were all by yourself or with one of the men. So they have a great advantage on you when you're fighting them alone. You got, you know, the country can't help you. Your other buddies can't help you. You're all alone. And it's a, a tough uh, fight to fight. But at any rate, this particular time, Sajan was in this little cell. And uh, as the, they had to take us out to go to the bathroom through this little aisle here. And as I passed Saijon's, the guards in front of me, and as I passed Saijon's cell, I moved the door in as best I could. And I looked in at him and gave him the high sign. I tried to encourage him here. And he, he looked horrible. He looked really, really bad. Uh, he looked like he was just about dead. And he was. He had been shot down in Laos. And there had been a three-day attempt to get him out. You know, four fighters and two choppers had been shot down trying to get him out. But his radio finally gave out. He was in heavy karst country. He had a bone sticking out through his leg, compound fracture. He couldn't move very well. And he had been hit hard uh, by the rock. This was heavy rock country, you know, really karst and cliffs and everything like that. So he'd been hurt real bad, and they couldn't. They couldn't uh, get him out. One time they were going to send a pararescue man down, but he said, no, I can get to the penetrator. This is about a 150-foot uh, triple canopy jungle that he's under. And he, he saw the canopy, the, the penetrator come down through the jungle. And he, and he said, we'll, we'll send somebody down for you. And he said, uh, no, no, I'll get to it. And, but the, the helicopter's under heavy fire and hovered there for 30 minutes taking round after round of hit. Finally, it had to leave because it started smoking and its engine started going on it. So it got out of there, and that was the closest we ever got to him. And he began his, without a radio, there was no way we could tell where he was. And he began th three uh, miles of travel to the nearest road. Uh, it took him 45 days to do that three miles of travel. For the first 10 days, he had no water. He had no food for the 45 days. So he lost all his flesh. He lost all of his body. He had, uh, you know, all his, he had to pull himself along with his hands. He couldn't use his legs. So his hands got all cut up. His bones were all bare bones here on his uh, knuckles. His knuckles were all bare bones. You could see all the joints and the bones and the tendons. His hip was half skin and half white bone. Okay, his face looked like a face out of a horror movie, uh, like a skeleton out of a horror movie. He just had a little flesh on his shoulder and arm where he had been able. It's not like the movies, you know, where there's a bunch of guys together. It wasn't like that for those first years. You were all by yourself or with one of the men. So they have a great advantage on you when you're fighting them alone. You got, you know, the country can't help you. Your other buddies can't help you. You're all alone. And it's a, a tough uh, fight to fight. But at any rate, this particular time, Sajan was in this little cell. And uh, as the, they had to take us out to go to the bathroom through this little aisle here, and as I passed Saijon's, the guards in front of me, and as I passed Saijon's cell, I moved the door in as best I could. And I looked in at him and gave him the high sign. I tried to encourage him here, and he, he looked horrible. He looked really, really bad. Uh, he looked like he was just about dead, and he was. He had been shot down in Laos, and there had been a three-day attempt to get him out. You know, four fighters and two choppers had been shot down trying to get him out. But his radio finally gave out. He was in heavy karst country. He had a bone sticking out through his leg, compound fracture. He couldn't move very well. And he had been hit hard uh, by the rock. This was heavy rock country, you know, really karst and cliffs and everything like that. So he'd been hurt real bad. And they couldn't, they couldn't uh, get him out. One time they were going to send a pararescue man down. But he said, no, I can get to the penetrator. This is about 150 foot. Uh, triple canopy jungle that he's under. And he, he saw the canopy, the, the penetrator come down through the jungle. And he, and he said, we'll, we'll send somebody down for you. And he said, uh, no, no, I'll get to it. And, but the, the helicopter's under heavy fire and hovered there for 30 minutes taking round after round of hit. Finally, it had to leave because it started smoking and its engine started going on it. So it got out of there and that was the closest we ever got to him. And he began his Without a radio, there was no way we could tell where he was. And he began th three uh, miles of travel to the nearest road. Uh, it took him 45 days to do that three miles of travel. For the first 10 days, he had no water. He had no food for the 45 days. So he lost all his flesh. He lost all of his 
body. He had uh, you know, all his, he had to pull himself along with his hands. He couldn't use his legs. So his hands got all cut out. His bones were all bare bones here on his uh, knuckles. His knuckles were all bare bones. You could see all the joints and the bones and the tendons. His hip was half skin and half white bone. Okay, his face looked like a face out of a horror movie, uh, like a skeleton out of a horror movie. He just had a little flesh on the shoulder and arm where he had been able to pull himself through. The body put all its, all the head kept in his muscles. He, they gave, they brought, brought him to a little, uh, a little uh, town, and they put him in a, like a little bamboo cot type of thing. They had a guard assigned to him. He called the guard over to him. When the guard came over, he had enough strength left to knock him out, and he crawled out into the jungle. And according to the North Vietnamese officer who told me this, it took him over almost a day to find him a whole village. Uh, he was trying to get away again. Uh, they found him, they brought him back, they put a monster cast on his uh, leg, and by the time he got to us, he had that big cast on, which, made, which was so heavy and so big he couldn't even move. It was straight, his whole left leg was from his hip to his ankle was on his cast. He couldn't even get up good. So the cast was full of pus. His whole body's full of pus. He's got you know just terrible wounds everywhere. And uh, they're beating the devil out of him to get him to say something. Uh, he only gives him name, rank, service number, date of birth. When the guard would leave uh, momentarily, you know, Craner and I would say, Lance, you're in no condition to take that. To give him something live and give him answer some questions for him. And he'd say, no, I'm all right, I'm all right. And he'd come in to beat his open wounds and so on with these clubs. And uh, at any rate, uh, Bob Craner and I, after a couple of days of this, they uh, had us get up out of our cells. And they said they needed some help to get him out because he was uh, trying to, he was full of uh, soiling himself all the time, you know, in the cell. And they said, you, you got to help clean up. And we got to clean up at a, a little pond outside. So we go and we pick him up, and when we pick him up, he looked like a real little guy in the cell. When we pick him up, he's bigger than us, and at the time when I was 6'3", and Craner was, you know, 6'2". And so we pick him up, and he's bigger than both of us by a couple inches. So I said to Bob, I said, geez, this guy's a big guy. And when I said that, he looked at me, and he says, aren't you Guy Gruders? And I said, yeah, who are you? He says, Lance. I said, Lance who? He said, Sijon, Lance Sijon. I said, oh, no, not Sajan. He'd been in my squad at the Air Force Academy on the football team. And the guy's about 80 pounds now. You know, he was 200 and something in the football team. And uh, just couldn't believe that it was the same guy. But at any rate, um, we took up, got him up to uh, Hanoi on a truck, on a truck ride that I thought there was no way in the world he was going to live through and needed to walk. But, but he made it up there, and they kept beating on him and beating on him, and he died after about a month of beatings up there. Never gave him a thing, because uh, and most guys were like that because uh, there was information that you had that could result in people getting hurt. And so, for love of the people around you, the other POWs, you'd never give them any information on anybody that you knew of, and you would never give any information on things you knew back in South Vietnam. Like, for example, if you knew, you knew where the ammo dumps were, you know where the storage was on the air bases, you wouldn't tell them that because they never blow them up, you know, maybe cause a lot of people to get killed. Or you wouldn't tell them the way you came in on a fighter mission and the different procedures you used because that would jeopardize guys in the air. So the reason you don't tell people information when you're being interrogated is so you don't jeopardize your fellow soldiers. You do it out of luck. That's luck. You, you, you don't hurt people, okay? You take care of your buddies. You take care of the guys that you're fighting with. Though so John was... Uh, perfect example of that kind of soldier.